All right. So without further ado, we have Loki presenting on GSM this morning or this afternoon. Sorry. And, and I'm here too. And what's uh, your name? Team Pierce. Team Pierce. Pierce. Logan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Pierce. I'm sorry. I missed that. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to let these fine gentlemen get on with it. Enjoy. So All right. the keys. The keys are mapped for that. So just go ahead and directly use the keys. Wait. Le le left and right. Yeah. Oh, complicated. <laughs> Okay, NSA Playset GSM, welcome to our talk. Uh, we're going to be talking about the NSA Playset today. We did uh, some fun GSM tools and we're going to talk about it. Uh, my, my name is Dean Pierce. Um, this is my fourth DEF CON talk. Uh, I've been attending DEF CON since DEF CON 10. Whoa. Um, I am an uh, information security professional and I work in the field of product security, which is great. Uh, it's way cooler than like pen testing. Like you actually get to like fix shit before it gets released on the market, and you, and you get to see really cool shit like years before it gets released. So it's good stuff. It should be a career path that people look into. Um, also, for some reason, uh, whenever I get a paper accepted at DEF CON, it's about wireless stuff. I've, t I've submitted talks to conferences all over the place, and the only place I've ever talked about wireless stuff is at DEF CON, and for some reason, those are the talks that get accepted, and all my non-wireless talks never get accepted. But anyway, that's about me. Thanks. <laughs> Hey, I'm Loki. Um, yeah, that's loud. Uh, this is my first time talking at DEF CON. In fact, it's actually my first time at DEF CON. Uh, um, so I've been doing software with some security stuff involved for about 12 years. Um, mostly data analytics type stuff. Um, they like calling it big data now, which bothers me. Um, and pretty much every role I've ever been in, I've had to do some sort of security stuff. Uh, I like seeing problems, which is why it's always been of interest to me. Um, and the GSM stuff about the past four years, I've had a heavy interest in and um, just kept playing with it. Um, and that's about it for me. So let's see. So GSM, um, most of you guys are probably familiar with it but it is the most widely used cellular system in the world. Um, and right now, uh, what, there's like 7 billion I think as of 2013 people worldwide using it. Um, going off of the GSM association, it's available in more than 219 countries, um, market share more than 90%, all that fun stuff. Um, and it's also the legacy network for most of the other uh, technologies in use today with the exception of the um, CDMA stuff which also means LTE is built on top of the GSM stuff. Um, right now there, if you make a voice call that is probably going over classic GSM whereas uh, eventually with LTE we expect to be seeing that go over data traffic at which point it's probably going to be more difficult to play with. Um, yeah. Hold on, slides. Um, one of the things that was interesting about uh, the GSM stuff was that it was the first to seriously consider any form of security um, with both uh, stuff like the um, Timsey code being used instead of uh, any sort of um, persistent mobile identity. It somewhat helped. Um, anonymize your usage of it from just a eavesdropper's perspective. Um, it also used A5 encryption, um, which there's various types of, you have your A5.1 and A5.2 are the standards. Um, and unfortunately what was rolled out to most of the world was uh, a slightly broken version of it, uh, even though at this point most of them have gone to the somewhat more secure but still breakable A5.1. There is A53, uh, but as far as I'm aware, there's no rollouts of it. That one, um, also known as Kasumi, um, nobody has any breaks for it at this point that we know of. Uh, so, well, I'm out of sync with my slides. Um, uh, sorry about that. So, his short history lesson um, in the 1990s. The um, first attack on A5 was proposed uh, on June 17, 1994, 
Ross Anderson posted a message to the uh, UK.telecom Usenet group, and in it he described a few potential attacks. Um, it was one of the, it was also one of the first publications of an open A5 cipher implementation. Up till then, nobody, the people had had some idea what it was, but nobody had uh, written any code or published any code that may represent what uh, it looks like internally. It was over 20 years ago. Yeah, that was over 20 years ago, um, and we're still using the same cipher today. Uh, in 97, um, at Eurocrypt, uh, I can never pronounce his name, it's Jovan Golik, presented um, cryptanalysis, cryptanalysis uh, of the alleged A5 stream cipher which gave a more formal analysis um, and presented a potential time memory trade-off attack um, which was sort of the basis for a lot of the further uh, attacks that happened. Uh, so in 2000, um, at the seventh international workshop on, fast, on fast software encryption, um, three guys uh, presented a um, paper on real-time cryptanalysis um, of A51, and then that one, um, that was the first attack to theoretically um, allow you to see decrypted traffic in real time. Um, also in 2000 at Indecrypt, um, two other people went ahead and presented um, essentially the same idea with a slightly different um, time memory trade-off technique. Uh, and so both of them theoretically allowed attacking A5 with varying amounts of known plain text, but they weren't really practical. So then 2003 came along and there was a paper released, um, Instant Ciphertext Only Crypt Analysis, and it was a ciphertext only time memory trade-off attack. It was practical but it required a ridiculously large pre-computation phase. Um, I believe it was on the order of 32 terabytes, which was not practical at all. Um, and then in 2006, the full version of the paper was released. Um, the 2003 one was significantly uh, cut on what they actually talked about. Um, and in that, uh, they went ahead and gave a lot more information that allowed you to basically come up with um, very short, or cracks on very short plain text up until then um, knowing five minutes or so of plain text was required, which again, impractical. So 2007, Coca Cabana, or yeah, Copa Cabana came along. Um, in that one, Coca Cabana was a hardware project, uh, it stands for Cost Optimized Parallel Code Breaker, and it was implemented as a FPGA based machine optimized for running most algorithms but specifically for cryptanalysis. Um, and it was commercially available eventually. Um, and it could be used for A51, A52, could also be used for many other things um, including DES. Uh, it went ahead and enabled brute for pure brute force attacks against GSM um, without any lookup tables. However, they, this was still not real time. Um, that was actually uh, done as a research project that eventually turned into a commercial solution. Yeah, I, w I wanted to jump in with 2007 because uh, this was also 2007. I attended Torcon and I saw Hikari give a really awesome presentation on uh, using FPGAs and USRPs to like crack phone calls with a couple thousand dollars and like 30 minutes per, per phone call and it was amazing and uh, that, that was the first time that I thought like it would be really cool if somebody actually like bundled it together and like sold it on eBay or something because that stuff's really hard to do uh, and they didn't really release any information on how to do it. And so uh, that, that was when I first kind of thought of the NSA place that bundle concept and then like uh, it's taken a long time to actually do stuff with it. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see, 2008. Uh, and 2008 was actually when uh, uh, Hikari first talked at ShmooCon and they talked about generating rainbow tables um, and the, 
the, ta the tables uh, got generated, but uh, a lot of the tools were uh, a lot of the tools didn't get released. A lot of the table the tables didn't get released. Uh, a lot of stuff just kind of didn't really happen. It was all still very much like a, a theoretical thing at that point, uh, which leads to 2009. And let's see, can I scroll down here? Whoa, it's backwards. Uh, so in 2009, uh, that's when you have uh, the there was a talk at Black Hat where they tried to kick off this uh, the A51 cracking project. So this was a you know a global distributed effort where everybody who had like you know fast video cards could all team up together and everyone was going to generate the A51 rainbow tables once and for all and it was going to be great. Uh, also, uh, it's re it's really fun to read the mailing list too. Uh, if you look, go back and look at the A51 mailing list at this point, because you have all these people like jumping in like, hey, you know, I've got this whatever card. It's not really optimized for whatever, and then. Everyone just kind of doing their own thing and trying to generate a couple tables here and there, and then uh, this one guy jumps on and is like, "Hey, you know, uh, I wrote this tool called Kraken that actually uses the tables and brute forces in, which is great and still what we use today." And uh, then the the tables got released. So, let's see, how do I get back to that over here? Yeah, there we go. Uh oh, good. <coughs> So uh, 2010 was uh, Karsten speaking at Black Hat uh, again and demoing, uh, demoing this stuff. And actually, they released AirProbe, which was great. Um, and AirProbe is the tool that um, uses the USRP to uh, to get the the raw GSM, and then you can figure out uh, some some of like the known plain text stuff, and then use that and crack it with the the Kraken tool and the A5 tables, A51 tables that were released. And then you could use AirProbe to decrypt the traffic, and he showed this all on the uh, the Black Hat stage, and it was great, and everyone applauded, and it was ve very wonderful. And they also talked about uh, the in 2010, um, Osmocon BB actually using the Motorola phones to start sniffing stuff, which is great because uh, they're a heck of a lot cheaper than the USRPs, which tend to be you know a couple thousand dollars if you get all the accessories with it. And then the phones are just you know. Silly little phones that you can get at any little store, and so that that was great. And then um, at the end of 2010, uh, Carson did a talk at uh, CCC that was um, he, he he was talking about a uh, broadband GSM sniffing, and so he used four different phones and then kind of monitored all frequencies and did a full range of sniffing everything with the phones, and it was was good. So nothing really happened. Oh wait, here, wait. Right. And nothing really happened in 2011. So as, uh, you know, GSM security was broken. It was done. You know, we're good. Everything's going to get fixed now, right? And so, unfortunately, that didn't really happen. Uh, but in 2012, we had this uh, this great thing. Is anyone here familiar with uh, the Realtek SDR dongles? Ah, uh, those things are great. So uh, th those started selling, and then people quickly realized that like, hey. Well, th these are TV tuners that were sold everywhere and under many different brand names, and people realized, hey, you know, they could just, you know, twiddle a couple bits here and then point it at whatever frequency they want and just start dumping traffic. So, all of a sudden, overnight, the software-defined radio community exploded because anybody with twenty dollars in their pocket could go buy this little uh, receiver and just start sniffing traffic, and it worked with all the GNU radio and all the the tools that the the more academic, like the big players with their, you know, USRPs and their more expensive radios, have been playing with for a long time. So, I don't know how to do. That. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, that that brings us to 2013, and we started seeing, uh, you know, Hack RF coming out, Blade RF coming out, uh, some some really good kind of um, medium end software defined radios that were able to transmit and do packet injection and do all sorts of. Uh, very, very cool things. Um, also, towards the end of 2013, I was able to take uh, Mike Osman's radio class at uh, Torcon, and that was a really great experience. And I would recommend it to anybody that's doing it. And so, and as as part of that, I kind of told him my my old weird idea of actually, you know, packaging packaging uh, packaging everything together and trying to get it all to work and just trying to get it out there as much as possible. And he thought it was really cool, and we kind of talked about it a bit. Uh, and then uh, at the end of 2013 was when the ant catalog was leaked. And uh, who here remembers the ant catalog? Anyone? Yeah, 
that was some really good stuff. Uh, a lot of really interesting things from uh, the N NSA, what weird toys that they sell to different parts of the intelligence community and it was great stuff but anyway. <clears throat> that brings us up to uh, 2014. Yeah. What was that? Okay. Well, it has the there. Yeah. So, 2014. Uh, this was this was the birth of the NSA playset here. It was great. Uh, we uh, after the uh, the ant catalog came out, uh, Mike emailed me and was like, "Hey, remember that crazy like NSA playset idea? Like, uh, like he he saw the stuff with the retro retro reflectors and the thing. And like, wow, that's really cool. He wants to make." much of those things and so we thought, you know, that would be really rad to actually pull everything together and like start actually seeing how much of the, the shit could be built. And so that was really exciting. I talked to Joe and I talked to a bunch of other people on like other uh, weird things that we could do and things that looked like they were pretty feasible. And so then uh, yeah, everything just started coming together at uh, uh, Mike gave the first talk at Hack in the Box uh, in Amsterdam and then we both talked at uh, Tour Camp and tried to recruit, recruit a few more people and our mailing list is now growing and growing. I think we've got about uh, 150 members on the mailing list right now. And so uh, that's, that's pretty great. And so what, what we've really tried to focus on with the playset stuff is um, making it as easy as possible to use uh, so that uh, it's just as accessible as possible and then also reducing the cost, making it more accessible. So as many people can play with it as possible. And so the, the motto that I've kind of been uh, saying over and over is uh, if a ten year old can't do it, it doesn't count. So because it, things don't really get fixed until they're actually extremely accessible and that's kind of a bummer. Because e even with all the great work that Karsten and all the Osmocom people did, I mean, all the we're still using a lot of the like crazy terrible cryptography and a lot of even the fixes that Karsten's recommended for the carriers uh, have not been, been implemented. So that's kind of a bummer. Let's see. That's yours. So with the with the NSA playset, um, it's actually sort of three separate things. Um, and I'll go over one of them and Dean will go over the other two. Um, but in general what we've done so far um, with the NSA playset for the GSM is we've got AirProbe successfully working with essentially um, any major SDR out there um, through the use of the Osmo SDR um, which basically gives us a single interface that supports the HackRF, the BladeRF, the RTL SDR, the US RP um, without having to worry about um, from our code what the back end is, what our signal source is. Um, we've improved the signal tracking uh, a bit. Um, there was a lot of problem with uh, drift especially with the cheaper RTL SDRs um, and so frequency correction code has been improved a bit. Um, the Kraken A51 tables and indexes have gone ahead and um, been uh, put on a single external USB 3 hard drive. Um, it's basically plug and play with the uh, Kraken program on any Linux machine at this point. Uh, it also works on OS X in some cases. <laughs> uh, and then also a bootable, bootable environment based upon uh, Kali Linux that has been upgraded with um, the uh, new radio 3.7. Um, and a bunch of GSM specific tools. Um, oh, and we also ported uh, the AirProbe GSM receiver to work with uh, 3.7. Um, so the bootable environment, um, you know, it, of course it comes with everything Cali comes with. It also uh, comes with the improved GSM receiver. Um, it comes with the, which is what you use to actually listen for traffic when you're using SDR. Uh, CCCH scan, which is a similar thing for the Osmocom BB phones. Um, it comes with Kraken binaries um, and various other tools, calibrate, stuff like that. Uh, so the first of the uh, NSA playset GSM tools, uh, and this one's not complete yet, it's not ready to be released, uh, is Twilight Vegetable. Twilight Vegetable is envisioned as a system that 
basically you turn on your machine and eventually you're going to start getting dumps of all the voice messages or all the voice traffic and SMS traffic that is within range for you. Um, the sources um, are basically any of the SDRs supported by Osmocom SDR um, as well as the uh, Osmocom BB and Samsung Galaxy devices. Uh, Osmocom um, BB is any Calypso chipset phone and then the uh, Samsung Galaxy devices uh, use something called X Gold Bond that uses the debugging feature um, in those devices to dump traffic. Um, and basically the Twilight Vegetable envisions those as just client interfaces that are detecting and dumping traffic um, to a central service. That central service is then handling um, all the decryption and stuff like that that's necessary um, as well as decoding into data. Um, let's see. So basic overview of the system. Um, you have the UM interface capture clients which are the SDRs and uh, Osmocom BBs. Um, those just send the data to the central dispatcher um, which basically consists of a uh, database server um, that we store stuff like session keys, um, TIMZ to MZ mappings, um, that sort of stuff in and then some, a bunch of custom software that's written around that database. Um, to send out to send requests out to Kraken to run uh, statistical analysis on the uh, encrypted data to detect you know what type of plain text we think it is, um, and then of course Kraken itself, um, which is the executable index files and the um, tables, um, with the potential uh, to have that load balance so that there's so that. Kraken definitely has a speed limit. You can go ahead and get around that using multiple instances. Uh, and so the UM interface um, capture device is basically one of these. We have it mostly written, but one of these uh, is written for each type of device. One for the Osmo SDR one for X Goldmon, and um, one for Osmocom BB. If a new uh, UM interface that is the radio side of things, capture device comes out, um, it should be able to be added relatively simply either by writing a complete new driver or hopefully Osmo SDR supports it. Um, so each of those is responsible for listening to one or more, um, they're ARFCNs, they're absolute radio frequency channel numbers, basically just think of them as frequencies. Uh, there's a direct mathematical mapping between the ARFCN number and a given frequency for a given uh, GSM band. And what it does is it goes ahead and detects any uh, what are called immediate channel assignment messages. These basically say, hey, I need you to switch to a new channel and I'm most likely going to send you encrypted data. So when the phone receives this, um, it switches to that new channel and the first message that's usually sent is um, a beginning crypto message which we know what that looks like. It's known plain text. So we can use it with Kraken uh, to go ahead and crack the rest of the traffic. Uh, so when it sees that channel assignment message, it goes ahead and starts capturing all the data on that channel. Um, once that channel is released or that channel is reassigned, since sometimes the channel release messages themselves are encrypted and we can't detect that until we've cracked it, uh, it goes ahead and it goes ahead, ends the capture file. Thanks. Sorry. Ends the capture file um, and submits it uh, to the uh, central dispatcher, um, what it submits is the error FCN, the, temp the TIMZ temporary mobile subscriber identity, um, the network information that is your uh, mobile country code and mobile network code, the cell ID and signal noise ratio um, which is important to tell if a packet is likely to have corrupted data in it or not. Um, and then as well it sends the uh, actual channel data that it's captured. So when it submits that to the central dispatcher, uh, where is my slide? The uh, central dispatcher goes ahead and 
um, provides multiple functions. Basically, it takes that in, puts it in a file store, um, enters the submitted data into a database, uh, linking to that file, uh, file in the file store, um, and then runs uh, statistical analysis on the packets to see which ones we know are plain text. Um, some of that is very simple such as this is the first packet, we know that it is a uh, crypto packet. Some of that is a um, thing, for instance a system information 5 message which um, we can, by looking at the plain text version of it, we can know what the crypto version of it is and we can detect whether or not it's that type of message with high likelihood based upon um, the comparison with the rest of the encrypted messages that are sent. Um, and so uh, it also goes ahead and stores any cracked keys that it gets back from Kraken uh, with their associated Timsies. Um, keys and are usually uh, reused for a given session with a given Timsy. So we're able to uh, go ahead and immediately decrypt anything in any data using that Timsy in the future. Um, and then it also, once it gets back a key and it's able to decrypt the data, it goes ahead and parses through looking for any SMS or voice messages um, and then writes them out to disk for you um, with an associated MZ if it's detected the MZ, MZs aren't sent very often. Um, so that's sort of the glue that holds everything together. Um, the next part of that is Kraken which we'll cover more later but Kraken um, when it, it's able to be run in server mode and it supports an asynchronous um, operation so that we can just submit a bunch of cracks to it and as it's able to or uh, sorry, submit a bunch of binary sequences to it and as it's able to match those um, and give us back potential keys, we can check those keys um, in whatever order they're returned. Uh, there's also the potential to go ahead and run multiple instances in parallel using load balancing, um, uh, allowing essentially a cracking cloud system to be built. So, our kit for Twilight Vegetable that uh, was being sold yesterday is basically a USB key and a nano SDR. So the USB key uh, we've been really happy with, USB 3.0 really nice and fast, it has Kali Linux on it, it's customized with GSM tools, oh and the second line is being covered, anyway, uh, being uh, uh, it's, you, you do have to boot it in persistent mode to get the uh, binaries that have been built on it. Um, and we'll go ahead and be releasing few, uh, further updates on it um, as we improve the system. Then we're also uh, including this n nano SDR. It's extremely tiny. Uh, to give you an idea. Can you hear me that? This is the RTL SDR. And I mean, that's about as small as you're going to get for any software defined radio I've ever seen. They're also really cheap. Um, they're 20 bucks. They have improved uh, crystals and capacitors. Um, and they come from a company called Newelec, which they specialize in doing uh, RTL SDR stuff, not just TV tuners. Um, so this specific device you can tune from about 25 megahertz to 1700 megahertz which unfortunately does mean that you can't do the um, higher bands such as the 1800 uh, GSM band or in other places the 1900 GSM band. However you can do the 850 band in the US which most places you have at least some representation on. Um, and the connector on it's uh, standard MCX, so whatever active antenna or, or better antenna you manage to find, um, you don't have to deal with any weird connection issues. Um, so Newelec actually was really nice and there's a few things about them. Um, we want to give them a sh shout out because they went ahead and provided us with some nano SDRs to throw out to you guys later. Uh, you know, free, free swag is always good. 
Um, and then as I mentioned, they have the improved electronics um, and they also went ahead and gave you guys a discount code. It's good through the end of August. Uh, but most important for, mo for a lot of you guys, they accept Bitcoin for software defined radio purchases. That's always sort of advantageous. Um, and they also work with other SDR stuff so they have more than just this in stock. Um, and they know what they're talking about if you have any questions about if you can use a given SDR device for a given purpose. And so that, that brings us to the next segment which Pierce will take care of. So, did anybody in the audience get a little Twilight Vegetable USB stick yesterday? It's uh, good stuff. We were selling them over by the Hack5 booth. Uh, I mean it's pretty much, it's a 16 gig USB stick if you have one of your own. Um, the image will be on the website tonight. It's like 7 gigs or something so it might be kind of hard to download at the hotel but I don't know. Uh, when you get home, download the image and make it yourself. I mean, and we will be releasing updates. Uh, all right. Okay. So, uh, who, who here remembers the uh, Genesis handset? It was the. It it, it was like it, it looks like a telephone, right? And uh, that's because it pretty much is. I mean, it's a it's a Motorola uh, Sliver L9. Uh, if you if you look at the picture there. And you know uh, they did some modifications to it. I guess they added some some memory to it and uh, some different uh, SDR components. But uh, essentially, it's this little uh, portable thing. And so, because you know NSA had uh, Genesis, I thought it would be good to make. Uh, wait, where do I go? Where? How do I get that out? Yeah. No click. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we made the uh, Leviticus handset. And so, and so th this is, uh, I mean, it, it, it looks like a regular, uh, you know, Motorola phone and that's because it is. You can buy these all over eBay. It's crazy stuff. But this is the Motorola C139 phones. Uh, so if, you, if you've ever looked into Osmocom BB, uh, it's a really great project. Everyone should look into it. Uh, all the documentation, all the talks, everything that you ever see about them uh, talks about the C123. And because of that and because of all the great demos that have been shown with the 123, um, they're kind of uh, expensive to buy on eBay. They, they go for as high as $200 sometimes for these little $5 phones. Uh, and so the thing is though, the 123s are really good in Europe. Uh, that's kind of, you know, the frequencies that they're pointed towards. But the uh, 139s, are made for the U.S. Uh, and they work really well in the U.S. and they work really well with all of the Osmocom tools. So uh, if you're going to be on eBay buying phones, you should buy the 139. It's great. Uh, so the in, in addition to that, you also need uh, this like a custom FTDI cable that talks serial over the uh, the micro audio port that's in the thing. So you pretty much you connect it in, you got a shell, and then all of the tools work with uh, those sorts of things. And also one thing that I didn't quite realize until I started playing with it is that the um, the firmware that you flash onto the phones actually exists only in me memory by default. Uh, you're typically not supposed to actually uh, persistently put the things on the phone. And so what happens is you know you turn your phone off, you turn your phone back on, and it's like a it's a regular cell phone. So that's great. Let's see. Doo -doo. So, as, as part of the uh, Leviticus handset, I wanted to throw some good demos on the USB. If you if you download uh, USB or if you managed to acquire one yesterday, uh, I got this tool. It's in the home directory. You, when you boot Kali, you boot into persistent mode, and all the tools are in the home directory. I, I made this shell script RSSI. Um, RSSI is a um, a firmware that uh, does kind of frequency scanning. And it's pretty neat. And so you do dot slash RSSI and it loads up the frequency scanner. And we're going to have a demo of that in a second here. <coughs> I also wanted to, uh, to show off some actual, you know, live GSM packet dumping. And so I put on this uh, layer one, uh, pushes a special image to your phone that essentially turns it into a, um, like a, a GSM 
kind of gateway proxy kind of thing. Like a, it's a, it's a layer one kind of device that you can do all of your typical like, hey, I'm, um, you know, a cell phone tower or whatever. You can do dialing or whatever, and you translate it all to layer one, and layer one it just spits it out, uh, GSM over the network, or it receives whatever. And the uh, CCCH scan, um, and I have it modified with a burst and uh, patch. If anybody knows what that is, it, um, it allows for uh, a, a lot of GSM dumping and seeing raw GSM traffic on the network, which is really great. And then you just load up Wireshark and you can navigate through, and it's good stuff. Uh, I had a couple problems. If anybody saw me trying to demo the stuff yesterday, uh, the for some reason the magic of DEF CON made it so that my uh, console device was no longer uh, TTY as zero uh, or TTY USB as zero, and uh, it had turned into like. Uh, S S4 or whatever, console 4. So anyway, I edited the shell scripts and now everything works fine. And so I've got actually a few more phones that I didn't really want to sell because they weren't quite working right. Uh, and so I've got a, a number more and they, they work fine. I just needed to edit the shell script. I don't know what was going on yesterday. But uh, it's also, um, all of the charging is done in software on these phones. So you cannot, uh, it's usually not a good idea to uh, to leave it continuously charging while it's plugged in because it, it might not be as good as the actual official charging software that's on there. And sometimes they'll overheat, sometimes they won't really charge. So, um, yeah, things like that. Uh, I also really wanted to enable uh, the Osmocom BB stuff happening in the US. Uh, there's a really great tool that Carson released last year at CCC uh, called GSM Map. Uh, GSM Map was a little uh, bootable USB stick. You boot up to it. Uh, you plug in your Osmocom phone. You hit the button, and what it does is it takes surveys of the GSM networks that are around you, and figures out all the different security features that they're using, and what patches they've applied, and what different things that they're doing, and then it uploads all that data to the GSM Map server. So if you go to GSMMap.org, you'll see this full map of like all the different uh, security technologies over time um, and it's pretty much entirely Europe. Europe is all the data sources. Uh, there's like three data sources maybe in the US. Um, so everybody who gets these phones should really contribute to this project because it's really great and it's really good to see, you know, security over time. <coughs> so yeah, like I said, search eBay for the 139. Uh, the track phones have a newer firmware on them that make them hard to flash Osmocom on. You can still there, there are ways to bypass it, but if you want to do it the easy way, just buy the, the singular phones and they work great out of the box. Uh, also, this guy that I've been working with uh, in Greece, he makes crazy modified hardware and he sells them on eBay. And so you can lo look him up on eBay or you can email him directory, uh, direct directly and he'll tell you all the crazy things that he's got. And he's got things for uh, charging and, you know, turning your phone into like a little base station or doing all, all sorts of fun stuff. But so. Another part of the project is the, uh, the, the drizzle chair. So. This is just, it's a tiny little hard drive, right? This is two terabytes. When the two terabyte rainbow tables people talked about like a few years back it uh, came out, everybody was thinking like, oh, two terabytes, you know, how many, you know, big rack bays am I going to need to do all that? And now it's simple little USB 3 thing. You can buy these for under $100. Uh, and what I've got on here is the first five gigs just has all the tools. There's a partition with all the tools and then uh, the rest of it is the rainbow tables. And one thing to know is that uh, the, the, the tables are in the partition. You can't just download the files onto a device and then use them as rainbow tables. You actually have to download the files and then use a tool to insert them in the partition. So if you buy one of these online, make sure that you also have a hard drive in your computer if you're going to be downloading it uh, via a torrent. Uh, you do actually need two. You need one to download to and then one to transfer them to afterwards. So keep that in mind if you're looking at doing this yourself. And essentially what it does is it uses a known plain text attack. So you, uh, you take some ciphertext that you see off the network and there's a lot of traffic that is very, very predictable that happens in GSM. And what you do is you, you find a packet that looks like a packet that uh, you recognize and then you do an exclusive war between the two and what you get is the raw A51 stream. And with the raw A51 stream you just grab a snippet of that and copy and paste it into Kraken and Kraken goes through the rainbow table thing and looks for a result and then uh, dumps it out uh, when it finds it. And then you can use the other tools to decrypt. <coughs> Demo time.
it, you see that it, it, it found one. But, wait, what is this? Oh, fun. working at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it seeing any signal? Anyone? I might have to reboot to do that. Blah. Okay. And so what, what I'm doing now is I'm just booting off of the USB stick that uh, we sold a whole bunch of yesterday. And it's the exact same USB stick that you would download from the internet to kind of make your own and let's see here. And the thing is it's just it's pretty much a, just a straight Kali boot disk with the persistent uh, image. And so it's a it's Kali 108 which was released a few days ago and then uh, it's just a home directory full of tools and all the tools do the uh, uh, the sniffing, the decrypting the, tra the cracking and we have uh, things like PyTackle kind of installed that on there that kind of work and um, all the air probe stuff that's kind of a pain to compile on all the different uh, systems because the, the maintenance is not really as good as it could be for a lot of the tools that are there. Let's see. Let's see if it starts up now. <laughs> and so yeah we just um, we got all the uh, Huh. Yeah, it looks like it's not saying the demo. It was working in the demo room. Uh, I don't know. Do you want to show There's something. Your adaptance yeah, I'll try that. Yeah, see, this is where the Q and A room comes in handy. <laughs> hmm. Blah. Okay. So. Yeah, we, we, we might not have uh, demos because it looks like the projector is not working the way it did in the demo room, but we might be able to show stuff on your laptop. Might be able to. It's in a VM. I can't show VM. Okay. Yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> I, yeah, I can't. I don't think I can show from a VM. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let me try. Yeah. See if this works. Okay, so it's very small. Um, I had already run this. It takes a long time to run. There's a tool called Calibrate that will scan through uh, frequencies, all the possible frequencies for a given GSM band and tell you which channels are active. So I ran that um, and it told me that the best channel in the area was um, ARFCN uh, 180 which is 869.4. The E6 is scientific notation telling it so I don't have to do megahertz. Um, and anyway if we go ahead and run this, this is um, using the little nano SDR with this thing. Um, it will start scanning so it's going to find the only device on the system and then if we flip over to Wireshark, I have a filter in here right now that just shows immediate channel assignments. Um, and you, these are the ones that are important for when you're trying to capture encrypted data. So you can see that it's captured five of them so far. And uh, I'm not going to be able to show you too much. Um, but so you got your header telling you um, the channel it's on and stuff like that. And then you have your immediate assignment data itself, which contains a channel description that get, tells you, hey, I now need to start capturing on, say, channel zero. Usually it's channel one through seven. This um, must be control traffic that's going to be encrypted. Um, and it really is that simple to start looking at GSM data in Wireshark. 
uh, if I remove the filter. Um, let's see, you'll see that it sends it to a given port, so that port isn't open right now, so we're getting ICMPs, but every one of these GCM or GSM tap messages um, is coming through and that's being captured live off the air. So, quick demo of that for you guys. Um, do we want to do swag? Uh, yeah. Okay. Where did you do the demo? I just. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, we, we're running out of time. Uh, yeah, we're out of time. But uh, we, I can also, if anybody wants to see afterwards, I can show off the uh, actually using the Osmo Comp phones and flashing it and how it's just a couple commands. Yeah, I don't have a mic. Yeah, if anybody wants to see afterwards, um, I can show off flashing the Osmo Comp phones with the little scripts that I have on the USB stick. But we have swag also, so uh, you're going to throw out your thing first. Uh, in, in, any questions? Uh, good questions get good swag. Bad questions get heavy things. So, yep. Wait, what was that? You don't have time for questions. We don't have time for questions. Okay. How how long? Is that two minutes? Or yeah, yeah, two minutes for, um, yeah, for the the the, the crack and drives. Yeah. So about two minutes. So. You done? Forty-five. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we'll be in the Chill Out Cafe for Q&A and um, if you got good questions, you get SDRs. Come ask us questions. Thank you very much. Don't forget yours.